But I'm so thankful that God gave birth to Mosaic in 2014, aren't you? I am. I am super thankful that God brought us here. And, and now, four years later, we're celebrating the goodness of Jesus. And if you know Jesus, you also know that um, he's not about buildings and maintaining buildings and structures. He's not about keeping rituals and, and, and traditions. He is all about loving people and stepping into their stories and changing their lives and, and, and their destiny. If you know Jesus, you know that too. He's all about giving people hope, a future. Say hope and future. This is our God. Je Jesus had one mission on earth when he was here. He said in Luke chapter 19 verse 10, 2,000 years ago he declared, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. That was his mission. That was his mission. And that mission hasn't changed. He has left the earth, but he said, I will send you the Holy Spirit, my Holy Spirit, to be with you so that you can continue this mission. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just glad that in that mission of Jesus Christ, of seeking and saving the lost, I was one of them. That, that, that Jesus found me and I discovered Jesus. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you, who's thankful here that you got discovered by Jesus? So, wow. Thank you, Lord, for that. And I just, as a church, that has always been our mission now, to, to bring people to Jesus Christ. Our mission is to seek and save the lost and point them to Jesus. <laughs> As a church, that's always been our mission. And because we know, here, here's why we, we embrace that as a mission. Because we know how it feels like to be lost. I love what Jen's wife said. I, I thought I was in control. I thought I was in control of my life, but actually I was lost. I was lost. Who felt lost here before Jesus? I, I, I felt lost. Even as a young kid, I didn't know where to go. And that wasn't literal, of course. I was lost. And God stepped into our lives. Thank God Jesus found us. And as we discover more of his love, we, we embrace the, the calling that we have to let people know about the love of Jesus. Aren't you thankful that God discovered you? God found you and you discovered God? But guess what? In, in this city alone, thousands upon thousands of people don't know Jesus. And have no idea that the solution to their lostness, to that feeling of hopelessness, is a personal relationship with God. And so you see, here's what I believe. Here's what I believe. Found people find people. Can you say that with me? Found people find people. If you know the direction where to go, you tell other people so they don't stay lost. Found people, find people. As people who have discovered Jesus, we should have this strong desire to want others to experience the love and the hope that Je Jesus gives. Who's going to tell the people around us about the love and the hope that Jesus gives? We are, and we should. Tell your neighbor we should. There are about 500 people who call Mosaic their home church. And that number is composed of people who come regularly, weekly, and it also includes those who show up once or twice a month, or, or once every three months. 500 people. But imagine every single one of the 500 people who call Mosaic home, imagine that these people will embrace their calling to evangelize, to make disciples, to share the love of God. If that happens, and if we would just obey the Lord's command to share his love with other people, you know what? By, if we start doing it this year, by, by, by December, this, this room will not be big enough for us. That is, if we would just embrace that call to find people because we have been found. Always remember that God found you, you discovered God, because somebody introduced him to you. Somebody did. That's the very reason why you're here. Somebody pointed you to the direction of Jesus. Because found people find people. People who know the way direct others. And I believe that God has destined every single one of you, one of us, for impact. Say impact. 
That's part of his plan for, for his promise of abundant life to all who will believe in him. In John chapter 10 verse 10. It's not about being richer in so many things. But part of the abundant life that Jesus promises is that you will be a person of impact. That you will, will cause waves to begin and, and to, to scatter and ripple around you in the name of Jesus. He wants our lives to make an impact in this world and the people around us. He, he doesn't want you to live your life daily just to wake up in the morning, have breakfast, take a shower, go to work and go home, eat dinner, watch Netflix, go to bed, and do the same thing all over again the following day. That is not what God has called you to be. But you know what? We're all trapped in that, right? Who feels trapped in that situation? We all do. <laughs> we all do. But you know what? God is, God's design for you is to make the most of, out of, of, of that routine that you find yourself in. That means you find what God is doing and, and just surf it. You know, just surf the waves that God brings to you. He has created you for impact. Can you tell that to your neighbor? He has created you for impact. But here's a problem. I believe a lot of Christians have the desire to bring people to Jesus, to evangelize, but they don't know how. They don't know how. That's the simply, uh, the, the, simply the, the problem. People don't know how to share uh, the love of God with other people. That's why we're doing this new series. Uh, this series is based on a sermon series by one of my favorite preachers, Robert Morris. And, and we're calling this series, The Church We See. Say that with me. The Church We See. This is a vision series. A vision in how we want to see ourselves in the kingdom of God. And, and the, the tagline is, living real together. Can you say that with me? Living real together. We're using the word real as an acronym for relevant, engaging, authentic life. Can you repeat those words with me? Relevant, engaging, authentic life. We want to live real lives together. And I believe God wants us to live a relevant, engaging, authentic life. Rele relevant. <laughs> That's a very important word. Engaging, authentic life. This is an evangelism series. Now, what is evangelism? Evangelism simply means telling the good news to others so that they will experience what you've experienced in Jesus. Telling the good news about the love of God. So each week, we will be talking about um, each of the four qualities, relevant, engaging, authentic, life-giving in relation to our role as individuals in the kingdom of God. And the first quality that we want to talk about today is relevant fishermen. Can you say those words with me? Relevant fishermen. Now, some of you perhaps love to fish. I don't. <laughs> I'm not a, a fisherman by hobby. But, but I love the story that we find here in the book of Matthew chapter 4. I may not be a hobby fisherman. But you know what? Many of us aren't. Who loves fishing here? <laughs> but the Lord tells us in this story that I will make you fishers of men and women. Now, what does that mean? We'll talk about it even more in a little while. But Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 20, talks about how Jesus called his first disciples. I talked about it a little bit um, in the past, just a few weeks ago, concerning the calling of Peter. But this is from a different perspective, the book of Matthew. And so before we read that, I love the fact that Jesus used fishing as an analogy to bring people to God. Why? Because he was talking and he was trying to invite fishermen to be a part of his team. Seven of Jesus' disciples were actually fishermen. Seven. And here's why. Jesus knew that he can use their skills to catch fish, to catch people. <laughs> Let's read Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. Just a few verses. And I'd like for us to stand again together and read these verses together from the Gospel of Matthew. And we won't stay here really long. Um, but we begin with verse 18. Together, one day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, Come follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. 
A little farther up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father, Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to come too. They immediately followed him, leaving the boat and their father behind. God, thank you for your word. Bless it to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. See, our first role in evangelism, in sharing the good news about the love of God, is to be relevant fishermen. I'm speaking in a generic term. And I know some of you might be saying, hey, but Justin Trudeau, so humanity is not right. It's you people. Right? Mankind, it's, it's, it's uh, what is it? People kind. But you know what? It's a generic term, right? Fishermen, male or female. We are supposed to catch fish. And, and like the first disciples, that's our calling. We fish for people. Again, it's not about recruiting people um, to do something, but it's all about helping people discover the unconditional love and hope and eternal life in Jesus and becoming a part of God's kingdom. We are called to fish for people and to bring people to Jesus. But we need to understand in, in, in order for us to be effective or relevant fishermen, we need to understand concepts in fishing. And so we had to, I personally had to talk to certain people. Pastor Todd loves to fish. Amen. All right. So if you want some fishing tips, he's been fishing all his life. First as a kid in, in, on the island of Mitiaro. And eventually fishing for souls in Canada. <laughs> so he's been fishing and he still fish like... Uh, as a hobby. Um, we were at the meeting at his house not too long ago, actually this past week, and he was recharging his uh, battery, his boat battery. There you go. Because he's getting ready to fish. He's just waiting for that, uh, what do you call that again? That cast to crack open, to hatch, and so he could go fish uh, in the summer. So, but our first role is to be relevant fishermen. I love that word relevant. That adjective makes a whole lot of difference. We want to be relevant fishermen. We need to know the concept of fishing to be effective and relevant in what we do. What Jesus did with his disciples was he taught them how to use their skills to catch people for the kingdom of God. So, Pastor John, how do we fish for people? Number one, very simply, very simply, put the bait on your hook. Put the bait on your hook. Can you tell that to your neighbor? Put the bait on your hook. You don't try to catch fish without a bait. All right? A lot of people don't like Jesus, the church, and Christianity because some Christians try to catch fish without a bait. They make Jesus appear, un appear unattractive. Uh, obligatory rules. And rituals that are repetitive. That's, that's how they introduce Jesus to people. But how many of you here came to faith in Jesus because somebody forced a rule or a ritual on you? I know I didn't come to Jesus because of a rule. And so what is this bait? If we're going to put a, a bait on our hook, what is this bait? This bait, listen, is any story about God's goodness in your life. Any story about God's goodness in your life. One of my friends goes to a church whose motto is this, making it easy for people to say yes to Jesus. Say yes to Jesus. That, that's awesome. That's what we want to be as people of God. To, and for people to, to feel when they, when they encounter Jesus. That what Jesus is offering you is something eternal and amazing. You don't want to give people a set of rules. That's not what Jesus did. We want people to feel that to make a relation, to have a relationship with Jesus is so attractive because it is. As we say here at Mosaic Church, life is so much better with Jesus. No matter what life brings us, even in the midst of a storm or a trial or failure, Jesus is our hope and our joy. Everything gets better with Jesus. And I love Psalm 34, verse 8, one of my favorite scriptures. It says this, O taste and see. Can you read those words with me? O taste and see. That what? That the Lord is good. O taste and see that the Lord is good. That is a bait. 
Now you think, when you hear the word bait, it sounds, it sounds negative, right? Oh, what is this? Is it, are they trying to fool me? Or they're trying to, right? No, 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 no. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. This is not false advertising. <laughs> what is your bait? Any story in your life about the goodness of God? Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, the joys of those who take refuge in Him. Your story of God's goodness and faithfulness is the bait that you put in your hook. And our story is not just a description of God's character. A lot of people think the goodness of God is something that you can describe. Almost like a, an academic description of God. But that's not how people receive the good news, right? Let me give you a treatise. A thesis. No, 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 no. no. Hey, let me share with you what God has done in my life. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Real stories of God's love. Real stories of His power. I love what Jen and Lovells said. How, how the Lord has just spoken to them when they started coming to Mosaic. And it led them to just say, hey, I'm going to get baptized. I'm going to follow this Jesus. This Jesus has brought so much joy in my life. Wow. That's a good story, isn't it? That's why we featured it. That's a great story. And then we have the story of, of Alex and Ryan, who said, we drive 140 kilometers one way because God speaks to us, and he's our joy. It's the highlight of our week. He speaks to us. He's our joy. Oh, we have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Those are good stories. Stories of your experience of how good God is. The changes that he brought in your life that draw people to God and experience him. That when people hear your story, they do see, they do taste God's goodness. I love seeing and tasting. They're, they're, they involve the senses, right? The Bible says faith comes by hearing the word of God. But you know what? When you start experiencing God, you get to taste and see. You get to taste. See, I can give you a description of a banana cream pie. I can give you a treatise. I can give you a thesis. I can even give you four pages of a write-up about a banana cream pie. But until you get to taste it, <laughs> you never get to enjoy it. I give you four pages. What, what do you do with it? What do you do with the four pages? I don't know. Maybe, you know, make paper airplanes. But I give you banana cream pie. And you get to taste it. You get to experience it. That's the bait. That's the good news that we want to share with people. We're not trying to fool people because what we present is real. It's not false advertising. You, you say God is good because he is. You say I've tasted and seen that God is good because he is good. And you've tasted and seen indeed. Wow. Wow. I love that. Listen, every single person on this earth wants to know God. Did you know that? Every single person would want to know and discover the true and living God. Even the strongest atheists, even if they won't admit it, they would want to experience God, even, even as a proof. Here's the thing. That, the reason why they say don't, they don't believe in God, because they've not tasted and seen, Right? But they do want to know if, if there really is. Most atheists are fake atheists. Did you know that? They're just not sure. That's why they say they don't believe. And here's why people have this innate desire to know God. The Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 3.11 that God has planted eternity in the human heart. There is something inside every human heart that longs to know the eternal, that longs to, to see or, or, or discover what eternity, what, what happens after death. It is there life after death? There, there is something in us that, that desire to know this sense of eternity. God has planted eternity in every human heart. And, and you don't have to have a bad story to have a good testimony. Did you know that? Some people were saved from a bad past. That could be a, that God could turn into a good story. And some people don't have a bad past. But both stories can be a reflection of God's goodness. Amen? 
See, the same grace of God that gets some people out of a bad past is the same grace that kept others from having a bad past. It's the same grace. It's the same goodness. And so you get to talk about it still. Who among you here grew up in the church and never left? Come on. A few of you. That's good. Some of you, when, when, when people ask you, hey, tell me about how bad your past is, some of you might say, ah, it's not really that bad. Some of you perhaps have strayed, which, which turned into something bad, or have experienced bad things, but God stepped into your life and redeemed you out of it. Whose, whose story is like that? I'm grateful that, I'm grateful that he did step into my life. So, Hey, God planted eternity in every person's heart and everybody wants to know God, even the strongest atheist or the, the confused, but they just want proof. And here, here's the thing. The proof for most of these people who want proof will have to be you. Can you tell your neighbor, I am the proof. I am the proof. Do you believe that God is good? Have you experienced his goodness in your life? You have a story to tell about the goodness of God. You have a goodness, goodness story, I, that's what I call. You've experienced it. Wow, I am thankful. The next principle is very simple as well. What's the first principle? Put your bait in the hook. Next principle, put your hook in the water. Put your hook in the water. You got a bait. God's been good to you. That's a story to tell. But until you put the hook in the water with your bait, you won't catch anything, right? So we need to share our stories of God's faithfulness with others. If we never tell our testimony, our stories of how good God is in our life, it's like walking around the lake with a bait on the hook but never really casting it. Because you're not telling your story. How do we cast the hook into the water? Number one, ask the Holy Spirit for power and guidance. Acts chapter 1 verse 8 says, you shall receive power. You shall receive power. Now, here's the thing. Lord, I have a story to tell. I need your Holy Spirit, your power to guide me and to give me the opportunity to share my story. Here's the thing. Ask the Holy Spirit for opportunities. He went there too fast. Opportunities. What does it say again, Jordan? <laughs> Power, guidance, and fruit. That's what you ask God for. You have a story, but you want an opportunity. You want the power. You want some guidance. And you pray for the fruit. You pray for the fruit. All right? And so here's, here's some, some, some things that we need to do as we put our hook in the water. Number one. And that, this is not, there you go. <laughs> Ask the Holy Spirit to pave the way. Say, pave the way. That's very important. You ask, Lord, you pave the way. As I leave my house right now, I pray for an encounter with somebody who needs to know about your love. Next, believe that the Holy Spirit is preparing that person already. God is never late. <laughs> He's never too early. <laughs> but here's what I believe. God is all-encompassing. So the place that you are supposed to go to, he's already there. The person that God is preparing for, um, for you to share the gospel with is already there. He, you just need to say, God, as you prepare that person, prepare me. I pray for an encounter. And here's the next one. Claim and rely on the Holy Spirit's guidance. And number four, believe the Holy Spirit for a catch. Say catch. So you put your hook in the water. Right? That's very important. Now, what does that mean? Now that you've, you've um, um, asked the Holy Spirit to guide you and to, you prayed all these things, you're expecting God for a catch, what do you do next? What do you do next? Here's, here, here's what you do. Learn how to tell your story in a genuine, interesting, and relevant way. This past week, I saw a movie with some of our, some of our guys here. Um... It was an amazing movie, well, an amazing story. It had an amazing story, but it was told in a rather flat way. It's called Wrinkle in Time, but it's not wrink really wrinkly. It was just like straight, flat. <laughs> we 
which resulted to many of us sleeping at some point throughout the movie. Have you ever been in that situation? This movie is just, oh, right? So boring. So, so listen, learn how to tell your story, God's story in your life in interesting and relevant ways. So number one, here, here's how you do it. Know your story by heart. Know your story by heart. Know the ins and outs, the twists and turns. Don't tell your story like you're driving through a straight tunnel with nothing around you. <laughs> but what you want to do is to tell your story and know it by heart. You need to create rapport when you tell the story. When God opens the opportunity for you to tell your story, create rapport. What is rapport? You know, sharing your story begins with connection. Say connection. That's rapport. Something that you have in common. You probably find that uh, with, with everybody. Some people might say, pa Pastor, I just have nothing in common with this person. You know what? You do. That's why God brought that person to you. You do. You're just ha going to have to look for it in a creative and relevant way. But also when you tell your story, you need to inject emotion. Say emotion. Now what am I teaching you here? I'm teaching you how to tell your story. The story of God's goodness in your life. Share your feelings because feelings are important. Some people are too reserved to share their feelings. You don't have to tell your whole life <laughs> and everything that you struggle with. Tell the goodness of God, but you do have to inject emotion and feelings because feelings are what? They're relatable. Say relatable. It's very important to be able to relate with somebody. And it brings excitement without sugarcoating the story. So, so don't tell people that you walked on water when you didn't, okay? <laughs> One time there was a storm. I saw it brewing. And I was so afraid, and I, you know, you, you don't really have to talk that way. I talk that way sometimes. But you know what? Inject emotion. But tell the truth. Tell how good God is. You say God is good, right? And you've experienced it. Tell it as it is. Always remember, here's another, number, the last one here. Always remember why you're telling your story. Always remember why you're telling that somebody how good God is. Always remember why. What is your why? Why do you have to tell the story? Because you want that person to experience the God you know. The Jesus that you know. So remember your why. And lastly, learn to drive the story home. The home run is inviting somebody to begin a relationship with Jesus. Your bait is your story about God's grace and goodness in your life, but your story won't catch anything unless the hook is in the water, right? It's not a story until it's told, so put your hook in the water. And here's the last concept that we want to embrace in, in catching people for Jesus. Fish where the fish are. <laughs> Make sense? Fish where the fish are. Here's a picture that I just found on the internet that you wouldn't want to do. Your bait is on the hook, your hook is in the water, but if the water that you picked is a puddle, you won't catch a fish. Content <laughs> without audience, no matter how amazing your story is, will miss the mark every time. Content is king. Say that with me. Content is king, but context is key. Context is key. You do not want to be fishing out of a puddle. Can I hear an amen? Makes sense. So here's the thing. Content is king, but context is key. When you share your story of the goodness of God in your life with somebody who, hasn't, uh, who has received Christ already, that is called edification. So when you share your story with somebody who is already a believer, that is called what? Edification. That means you're building up that person's faith. That person is already in the faith. And so when you share your story, what is that? You're building up. You're building up. So, so when we heard the story of, of, of Jen and Lovell and, 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 um, and Karen and, and the, uh, Alex over there, it encouraged us that God is indeed at work in people's lives. But if they tell their story to somebody that do not know Jesus yet, it becomes what? Evangelism. 
You're telling the good news of how good God is to you and that they can experience it too. So context is key. Fish where the fish are. We need a balance of both evangelism and edification. But your story is irrelevant without an audience, right? So, so here's the thing. Go where the fish are. Launch out into the deep. Jesus calls us to fish for people. But the problem with that phrase is some Christians find a loophole in that phrase. The deep side of the pond is too far. It's too risky and too uncomfortable. So many Christians try to catch fish from aquariums. That's not fun. <laughs> they try to share and invite those who are already believers. A few summers ago, Someone posted an invitation about an event, on uh, an evangelism event. This, there's this person coming to, to Lloyd Minster to share the gospel with people. And, and he posted it on Facebook. And he tagged and invited everyone from the other churches that he know of, myself included. And I told him privately, hey, you know what? That should not be the case. If you're going to invite somebody to get to know who Jesus is, find someone or people who don't know Jesus. I know Jesus. But if that's going to be more effective, and if you want that event to be effective, find somebody. Invite people who don't know Jesus yet. I told him if he wanted for that event to be fruitful, invite the skeptics, the non-Christians. He got mad at me and unfriended me on Facebook. <laughs> but in Luke chapter 5 verse 4, Jesus tells Peter, launch out into the deep. Say the deep. See, those of you who fish know that the deep is where the fish are usually are, right? You go to the deep. That's where they are. And for most fishermen, they go at night. That's when the fish come out. So fishing is, is, is really isn't, isn't easy. And people are afraid of that. People are afraid of, of the difficult side of fishing. But once you feel that tug, that bite, and you reel the catch in, what joy do you have in your heart? What excitement do you have? You, put a, you take a picture and put it on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, uh, uh, even on Tinder. Hey, look, I caught a fish. Wipe right. You just want to be proud of it. There's joy in the catch. <laughs> See, the person who shared the gospel with you, who brought you to church, there's joy in their hearts when they said, when, 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 he, when they heard you say yes to Jesus. Do you agree with me? One of the people that we baptized this past baptism service, when I told the, the person that, that invited her, I said, you know what? She just gave her heart, her heart to the Lord. She wants to get baptized. And she was like, yeah! I said, you get to baptize her. And she was like, yeah. She was just so happy. It may be difficult, but you know what? The joy that comes in seeing your unbelieving friend come to faith in the Lord. Oh, man. And the Bible says not just here on the earth where there is rejoicing when somebody comes to faith. Whole, the whole of heaven rejoices when one person comes to Jesus. So launch out into the deep. Don't try to fish out of an aquarium. Because it's out into the deep where God is calling us to be. The hard to love, the skeptics, the, the burned out in religion, the angry, the depressed, the anxious, the lonely, the unwanted, 
etc. They're all in the deep. In the depths of hopelessness, in the depths of despair, in the depths of need, you don't even know what your friend or your classmate might be going through when you see them at school or at work. They're in the deep. And you see them casually and they say, hey, hi. Doesn't show that they're actually in the deep, but they are in the deep. There is a reason why the word depression is called depression, because they, they feel down and low. A lot of people walk around the city and around this community, around this, this region, are in the deep. Where is God calling us? To launch out into the deep. Because that's where they are. And to be honest, that's where we were. That's where I was before coming to faith in Jesus Christ. I am glad somebody came into that area where nobody wants to go and launched out into the deep and got me. I'm glad somebody went into the deep and caught you. Aren't you thankful? Aren't you thankful? I am thankful. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That somebody was obedient enough to launch out into the deep. We were all there at one time. But praise God, he lifted us out of the deep. I never imagined myself doing this in front of you. I'm glad somebody launched out into the deep to find me. So that's where we go. Can you tell your neighbor, your, your next, your, your seatmate, hey, that's where we go. Tell them we launch into the deep. We need to tell our stories. Here's the thing. Intentionally, intentionality is as crucial as divine appointments. Let me say that again. Intentionality is as crucial as divine appointments. We need to share our stories with those we encounter every day. Every day. We, we live, we work, and shop with people every day that you don't even know might be swimming in the deep. You want to start a conversation with them and tell them how God has changed your life. Tell them how good God is. There is such a thing as hope. Not just hope in this life, but hope for the future. That's what the Bible tells us. God said, I have a plan for you. I know my plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. That's the kind of message that we want to give to people. And so every situation can be a place for the harvest to take place. Even the most difficult situation you find yourself in can be a place to catch something or somebody for the Lord Jesus. Every setting is a divine appointment. Every setting. God is the God of time. And so if you believe that He is, every time, every minute, every second, hey, God can, God, that is, that's an appointed time. Even now, you sitting here listening to some preacher, originally from Asia, hollering about the goodness of God. You are here and hearing this story, maybe for the first time, and you're thinking, I want to know this Jesus. I am in the deep, and I, I want to get out of this depth. Jesus is pulling you out. Can I hear any man? He is pulling you out right now. Because this is your appointed time <laughs> to know Jesus. So here's the thing. Listen, wake up each morning with a plan. Say a plan. To share your story. Wake up every morning having a plan in your heart. I am going to tell my story to whoever God brings into my life. Wake up each morning with a plan to share your story and a prayer for divine appointments. But you won't do that until you feel the sense of urgency. The sense of urgency. Say urgency. I mentioned to you there are people whom you see at work, at school, at the gym, who look normal and happy, but they're swimming in the depths. Some of them 
or perhaps on the brink because they couldn't find hope for the future or on the brink of just saying goodbye to this world. I want you to see that sense of urgency. Feel that sense of urgency. That there are people around you that you might not see next week. That you might not see tomorrow. And so you tell them who God is and what God can do for them now. The divine appointment. Acts chapter 4 verse 20 and we close with this. The, the disciples in their love and their sense of urgency, the feeling of urgency, they said, as for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. A person who has experienced the goodness of God will never and can never be stopped from telling others what God has done in their life. You can't keep quiet. A person who has experienced the goodness of God cannot keep quiet. Why are some people quiet? Perhaps because they don't know how to share their story. Now you do. Now there's no reason to be quiet. Amen? There's no reason to be quiet about the story that God has brought in your life. So here's a challenge for all of us on this anniversary weekend and our anniversary month. Here's the challenge. I want for you to share the gospel. And, and I, I, you, you say, Pastor John, this, you always do this every year. Yeah, because our mission hasn't changed. It hasn't changed to seek and to save the lost. So here's the challenge. For the next few months, from May to December 2018, my challenge for all of you now is, now that you know the child's story, share the gospel with two people this year. Share the gospel with two people this year. Share your story. And don't just share your story. Here's what I want for you to pray. I pray, I ask you to pray that you lead them to take the next steps. Not just to tell them your story, because if you just tell them the story and they don't make a decision, that's not a catch. It's like somebody biting, uh, it's just like biting off of your, your bait and that fish runs away. <laughs> or swims away. And so here's our prayer. That, that you would reach and share, pray for and share the gospel with two individuals this year from May to December. Is that something that you can pray for? I want to challenge you to do this. Two individuals, and again, not about recruitment, not about becoming the largest church in the city. It's about Jesus wanting people to know his love. That's all there is. And they will not know they are loved until you tell them. And so here, you pray and you share with two this year and gently but surely lead them to take the following steps what are the steps evangelism you lead them to receive Jesus say receive because that's how relationship with God starts you receive him as your Lord and your Savior the next step is this baptism following Jesus salvation begins with the receiving of Jesus but the following begins at the baptism did you know that and then you lead them to discipleship. What is that? To help them mature in their relationship with God. This person might say, hey, teach me how to pray. And you teach that person how to pray. This is how I pray. Hey, can you teach me how to read the Bible? I just don't understand the Bible that well. Hey, here, I'm going to let you do it. I'm, 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 I'm going to teach you. And then you lead them to serve Jesus. I'm telling you, the joy that you will have is going to be eternal. Eternal. We are not called to recruit. We are called to what? To let people know that Jesus loves them. So here's a challenge. Pray about it let this word that you just receive die out. I want you before you leave this place to embrace this challenge and say, God, I take this challenge. You have been good to me. I have seen and tasted that you are good. Somebody's got to know about it. 
but you don't go to a puddle. You launch into the deep. So if you want to invite somebody to church next week or in the following weeks, don't invite somebody from some other church. <laughs> invite somebody who is longing and, and, and wanting to know who Jesus is. We will sing a song as we close. But before we close, I have this final challenge to some of you who might not know Jesus yet. The question is, have you received Jesus? You have not been caught until you receive Jesus. You're not in his kingdom until you receive Jesus by faith. How do you do that? Very simply here in our, in our church, we just say, hey, it's about receiving Jesus into your heart. Believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead. Declare him as your Lord. That's as simple as, as, as it sounds, right? But that's, that's what it is. Receiving him as your Lord and Savior and declaring that he is your Savior. <laughs> declaring it with your heart. Uh, next question is, have you been baptized? Maybe you have received Jesus, but you haven't really followed him. And I, I said this earlier, receive, salvation begins with receiving Jesus, but baptism is the step, the next step, the first step in following Jesus. You have not truly followed Jesus until you do this, because even Jesus was baptized. You say, I, I don't get, get baptized. I was baptized as a kid. But you know what? The Bible teaches us that, that baptism is a decision that a person has to make willfully. Not something that somebody else did or chose for you. That's why we say that you need to be a believer. You, you, have, to be, you have to profess your faith. You have to declare your faith through baptism. Some of you have already been baptized. You've done this. And so praise God. But baptism is the first step of obedience. But the next one is, are you maturing in your walk? Are you growing? Are you growing in your faith? And finally, are you serving in his kingdom? Maybe you just come to church every week and there's nothing wrong with that. Just keep coming. But my challenge to you is you want to embrace your calling and say, God, one of these days I will serve. Make it your desire to serve. So I'd like for us to stand together and as we close this time, I'd like for us to, to make decisions based on these four questions. If you haven't received Jesus, today I say to you, receive him as your Lord and Savior. It's a matter of saying, Jesus, beginning today, you are my Lord. I believe that you died on the cross and God raised you from the dead and to, for, so that I will be saved. Now I declare you are my Lord. It's as simple as that. For those of you who haven't been baptized, I want you to make that decision now. And make, there's a sign-up sheet outside and say, God, I want to take that first step of obedience. I know I have been baptized in the past, but this is the first time that I will make that decision for myself. Maybe you should do that. You want to mature, join a D group, join a small group. If you want to serve, start serving. Let's close with a word of prayer. But before I pray, I, I just want to challenge that person who's here, who hasn't received Jesus yet. I want you to pray with me out loud. And for the benefit of that person, let's, let's pray it all together. Lord Jesus, thank you that today I get to be a part of your kingdom. I am a catch. I believe in my heart that Jesus, you died on the cross but rose from the grave so that I might be saved. I now receive you as my Savior and my Lord. Live your life in me. Fill me with your spirit. In your name I pray. Amen. If you pray that prayer for the first time, you have just become a catch. I'd like for you to let us know that you're dis about your decision. Find a connection card and, and just write your name. You don't need to give us any more information. Just your name. And there's a box there that says, Today I receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. Tear it off and give it to, and leave it with our Next Steps table people. And they'd be glad to, uh, to give you a, a Bible and, and something else as a way to thank you and to, to, to commemorate what you have just done. All right? Amen.